Terracon sighed as he flipped to the next crisp vellum page in the book of collected witches' fables. It was a shame to him that the stories made humans reliant on amulets and reliquary, and he wondered why some humans preferred these tales to their own. He had brought this one bit of literature from his father's library back with him to the castle, and regretted not having grabbed some other pamphlet or novella. The large door beside Terracon creaked open, distracting him from the book. He looked up. Nesu entered exhausted and irritated, but forced a smile and waved his hand to invite Terracon to go back with him. Is it a princess? Terracon begged as he stood up. Nesu ignored Terracon, but held the door open for him. Terracon accepted the invitation. Two women in plain, blood-stained clothes walk back and forth between the edge of the bed, a closet, and a basin. Osmara was laying on the bed beneath thin black sheets. Her smile was so broad that every wrinkle on her aging face was deeply creased. Terracon walked to the bedside and sat down on an adjacent chair. It was warm, and Terracon was comforted to know somebody had been at her side through the labor. Osmara was cooing a bundle of black fabric curled in the crook of her arms. She spared Terracon the shortest peak of salutation, but was otherwise too enthralled to speak. Terracon could sympathize after he noticed the joy glistening in Her Majesty's eyes. Take her, Osmara whispered, and Terracon needed a moment to make sure he had heard her correctly. He stared at the armful of black fabric, petrified. Finally, he leaned forward and embraced the bundle. He tightened his grasp slowly, worried that it might squeak from too much pressure. Certain that the heaviest lump was pillowed securely in his elbow, he delicately drew back the blanket. The fringed hem teased his curiosity as it brushed away to expose the fleshy babe sleeping soundly. She weighed nothing, but he continued to overmaneuver as she felt heavier than anything he had carried before. She began to wriggle. The lashed slits over each fattened cheek broke open and betrayed their hidden treasure, a sparkling pair of amethyst eyes. Shades of purple twinkled in and out, reflections were refracted in the facets, imagination ricocheted against Terracon's thoughts. He was distracted by inspiration. His arms grew heavy. He grew weak. The tiny mouth opened to yawn and exposed the baby's toothless gums. She shut her eyes and retreated back into her slumber. With the contact broken, Terracon's consciousness flooded back into him, and he quickly reasserted his grasp on the child. She's beautiful. I have to thank you for her, Osmara said. We all have to thank you for her. Terracon looked up at Osmara. Her tone and demeanor were quite serious. Terracon offered the child back, hoping Osmara would focus her attention at the babe instead. Osmara snaked her arms around the child and, much to Terracon's relief, returned her gaze to it. Her voice, however, continued to address the captain. Terracon, I do not know what would have happened had you not been there to rescue us. Perhaps another would have saved us, but for whatever reason Black Magic found you fit for the task. She turned her attention to Terracon again. If you had not reminded me of what she means to me, and to all of Escombreco, I would have lost her to that pixie. You have granted me the opportunity, the honor of bearing this child. You granted her the honor of the curse. She, I, we, the daughters of the House of Hexen, are in your debt. It was my duty. Terracon was wary of the Witch Queen's confession. That is my purpose, as it is the purpose of all in the service of Her Majesty. He rattled off the most doting answer propriety could demand. Do not be humble, Osmar chided. You have been dutiful to your lady in a way no other knight ever has. What if the knight is your own son? Is that not a worse duty to endure? The baritone voice rumbled with laughter. Terracon looked up. Draco, darling! Osmara's face lit like the dawn. She shifted the baby against her breast and opened her arm to the giant, bearded suit of armor who approached her bedside. The auburn beard tickled Osmara's blushing cheek as Draco leaned over to kiss her. 
Mother, I rushed back to the castle as soon as I heard. Come, let me have her. Draco reached over Osmara, but she quickly clutched the baby out of his grasp. Not with that armor on, and certainly not with those filthy gloves. Her voice blistered with thunderous revolt. Draco laughed. He peeled away the gloves and then called on Terracon to help him remove the suit. Terracon snickered as Draco anxiously fumbled with the armor's latches. The verdigris bronze plates were peeled off of Draco's massive arms and barrel chest. Finally freed of the excuses of his mother's contest, Draco pried the baby girl from Osmara. Oh, do be careful, Draco, Osmara whimpered. Mother, you act as if I have none of my own. Yes, but this is a baby girl. Come now, you have no sense of gentility. I have plenty sense of gentility, mother. You drowned me in gentility until I could swim away. I could navigate the sea of gentility and find my way home, disgusted and ill-tempered from a lack of exposure, curiosity, and denial. You sound like Merkiner, Osmara laughed. Oh, mummy, save me, Draco shivered at the idea. Where is that antique piece of parchment and the fop, anyway? Should they not be at your side as well? Should be, but are not. Alas, Draco, you alone love me. Do you hear that, Terracon? My mother has confused my duty to her for love. Draco laughed. Osmara scoffed. Terracon was certain he was expected to smile. As the heavy ebony door slid open, everyone turned to see Nesu peer into the room, clear his throat, and announce, The castle is ready, your majesty. The assemblage stood with the queen and followed her hissing train as she marched through the halls and down the winding staircase of Castle Salisane. Half of Osmara's body was weary from descending the spiral stairs, and she was dizzy from the carousel of stacked masonry rotating around her. Further agitating this vertigo was the strain with which her eyes sought to discern details out of the fog that rolled in from the lake. Sunlight was diffused into an opaque ambient haze, which heightened the contrast between the pasty walls and ebony doors that decorated the castle like checkerboard tiles. The twirling steps ended abruptly, and the queen and her entourage poured through the expansive great hall to exit through a pair of tall arched doors. Outside, cool breezes carried the salted aroma of the sea. The parade of nobles and uniformed servants passed through a large cobblestone yard littered with wooden crates stacked like children's building blocks. The cranes that stretched overhead cast streaming shadows across the path of the procession. They crossed the cargo-laden courtyard to an adjoining gate. Beyond the portcullis, a nearly endless expanse of water opened before them. The congregation was herded down a series of stone ramps that wound around the lonely watchtower to a pier. Vibrations rattled the algae-splatter dock as a banistered, carpeted gangplank was cast from a decorated barge. The ship was barely longer than it was wide, with a broad, barrel-roofed cabin perched just aft of center. It was a galley, and below deck, taskmasters were readying a school of enslaved water fairies to swim the boat to its destination, the newly constructed sea castle of Osmara. The typical bustle and commotion of the yard's laborers, or the fishermen preparing their dinghies, was absent, replaced instead by the procession slowly waddling on board. Terracon turned around to take one last look back. The cawing seagulls, which he had learned to drown out during his stay, soared aimlessly over the sea gate. From the port's low vantage, the keep steeples were barely visible over the crenellated wall. Castle Sassain had been their home for only a few months, but the achingly uneventful and paranoid quality of the stay had made dubious the hope that they might ever leave, even as they were departing. Will you miss Sassain? Terracon asked Osmara as they boarded the vessel. Osmara's fist was tightly clenched around several layers of black skirts, holding them above her ankles so as not to trip as she ascended the ramp. Miss Castle Sassain? Preposterous. Castle Domara I will miss. I always enjoyed the breezes and seclusion of my great-grandmother's residence. After spending the better half of my adult life trying to escape my mother's castle, however, I can hardly relish being back. Let some other princess find leisure in the dreary fogs that ceaselessly blink at this pallid fortress. The gangplank was reeled in after the last guard boarded. The passengers recessed to the cabin for entertainment and refreshments. The exertions of the merfolk in the galley below was silent above deck, 
so the currents which towed the ship away from the dock and out to open water seemed like nothing but a convenient happenstance. A serpentine figure had broke the waves before the bow and spritzed salty sprays on the cheeks of the passengers gathered to stare over the rail and out to sea. The morning sun was prying itself from the straits of Tabrillion and used its reflection glinting off of the water to wave its hello to the ruckus festival on board. I did not expect to see you out here, Terracon remarked as he approached the queen. Osmar turned to him, startled. She was holding the princess in her arms. I thought some fresh air might do us good. It may be hard to believe, but there are only so many Venetian chagrins and syrup-sweetened wyvern rollades that a witch can eat before they all begin to taste the same. Besides, today I opened my dedication castle. I want to see its towers climb over the horizon, to see how it announces the arrival of this generation. How is she enjoying the trip so far? Terracon peeked past the blanket toward the baby. The quality of their conversation had become less formal during their stay at Sassane. They could reserve the pomp and honorifics for the public. You are not worried that she might be exposed out here to some mermaid's glamour? No, Osmara shot down his query. It would be too bold for a fairy to attack with the limited resources provided by the sea. Besides, I will not be driven into hiding by potentials and maybes. Perhaps the encounter in Domara has you mistaken, but I am quite capable of holding my own against the Fae. I was a hunter in my youth, tracked and made sport out of catching and classifying fairies. This princess is in no danger. I had no idea that you were a hunter. Not avid, anyway. Osmar restrained a proud chuckle as she spoke. Very much so. My mother hunted. Mostly dragons. For trophy. And what of my retired general, Ritzian? Has your promotion turned his taste back to a more urban living in my castle town? Terracon's eyes declined with his reply. No, but I did not ask him either. He has his life at the estate, and nothing I could say would make him forsake my mother's buyer dwelling. Love is a pitiless thing, Osmara sneered. Choosing without consideration to the soul whether to fester slowly or engulf immediately. How fortunate for humans that the brevity of their lives means they lose little when they die pursuing it. If ever there was a measure of your father's bravery, it would be promising his affection solely to a human whom he knew he would outlive. His endurance is inspiring. The sun was perched at the zenith when the boat arrived at Castle Osmara. The masses gathered on the pier gave a congratulatory roar as the queen took her first step from the gangplank. Draco welcomed her with a kiss to her hand. In return, she wove her slender arm through his to be escorted to their new home. Tradition demanded symbolic gestures, and this procession was no different. Osmara had borne her fourth and last child, her first and only daughter, and a castle was built in her name to commemorate the closing of this generation. General Brienne's suggestions had helped the architect build the new capital residence on an island in the southern Twin Lake, not far from an already prosperous seaside city. The practice of walking from the previous residence was a metaphor for the journey Her Majesty had made to bring forth the next generation. Osmar had wanted a castle at sea, however, and this significantly reduced the journey from Sassane, as most of it would be by boat. Osmara would have to walk little more than the avenues that meandered from the sea gate to the craggy peak of the isle on which her new keep stood. The cavalry made a formation around the queen. Terracon headed the escort. Both he and the chestnut unicorn on which he was mounted were fully dressed in plates of sleek black armor scrawled with silver. The long, forked pennants strung from Terracon's lance and the caparison draped over the unicorn's back were emblazoned with the royal crescent crest and whipped about by the wind. Hooves clapped against the planks of the dock as the cavalry led the queen to her position in the parade and rapped against cobblestones as they passed under the sea gate and into the town. The castle's towers loomed black and ominous over the terraced neighborhoods. The stronghold's numerous spires seemed to support the sky on a bed of nails. Even from this distance, Osmara could see the braided ribbons sculpted as trim on the walls and the pairs of iron spikes that jutted from the battlements. 
she could distinguish the olive-green glass that paned the elaborate arched windows by which she would soon sit and admire the vantage over the sea. The gatehouse, which delineated the city from the castle's double ward, arched over the end of the promenade. The spiked tips of the portcullis hung in the doorframe like teeth in a mouth, which, when paired with the windows, gave the gate the guise of a monster that swallowed the parade. The masked acrobats wheeling at the lead were dressed only in paint and bangles. They dragged sheer scarves to trace the movements of their dance. They were followed by flautists, trumpeters, and strummers. Bongos, strapped over the shoulders of their burly bearers, were beaten in rhythm with the trotting hooves of the unicorns which flank the royal family. The music of the procession echoed off of the gatehouse's walls. The volume grew so great in the passage that the walls seemed to tremble and shake in time with the music. The parade poured out the gatehouse into the castle's divided inner ward, twin lots constrained by a curtain wall. This mire of partitions, battlements, and turrets all culminated in the complex of apartment towers. A mess of steeples and gables stretched into the sky. They cast their shadows over the terraced gardens that ascended around the keep's foremost tower. Wiry stalks and shrubs, too young to yet be lush, were stuffed into the steps. A wrought iron palisade fenced off the flowers from the flooding crowd. The gathered masses were being herded back from the approaching queen by acolytes bearing bannered staves and soldiers wielding polished spikes. The clothing of the crowd turned them into a patchwork quilt of colors and textures. Light slipped off of the silk brocades to be lost in the lush of velvets or padded dry on the broad cloth and denim. The splotched palette was matched by the celebratory cacophony. The voices cheered in tones as vibrant and varied as the colors of their clothes, a joyous fuss made to welcome the royal heir. Osmar's train nodded around her slender ankles as she turned to examine the courtyard. She closed her eyes, took a deep breath, and, just as she had imagined, could smell the salty air of the southern twin lake. This was her castle, a home for future generations. Osmara raised her hand. The ecstatic cries from the crowd faded into anticipation's soft murmur. She stripped back the black fabric from the babe in her arms, lifted it, exposed it to the sky, and cried, This is Cassandra. This is your future queen.